We're recording this episode on Sunday, March 6, 2022. Right now, the battle for Kiev is ongoing with missile attacks, shelling, and skirmishes between tanks and soldiers on the ground. If reports are to be believed, more heavy armor is on the way, and Russian forces are looking to encircle the city. We do not know what will happen in the next few days, so by the time this episode is published, the situation may be completely different. But we do know that Kiev has been the site of battles throughout history, and in this episode, Indy is going to be looking at some of them. I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is Into Context, a Time Ghost documentary format where we provide historical context to the headlines of today. In this set of episodes, the war in Ukraine. So let's start with a battle for Kiev from the ancient chronicles. During the 11th and 12th centuries, Kiev is the most important city in Eastern Europe. It is the capital of the first major Slavic state, the Kievan Rus, and a commercial hub which connects Europe with Constantinople, the Caucasus, Baghdad, and more. Population estimates vary anywhere between 30 to 100,000 inhabitants. But even that lower end is pretty big for a city at this time. But like many other great historical states, the size and opulence of the city is its downfall. As the Kievan Rus fragments, competing rulers battle for control of the city and it's also subject to frequent raids by Turkic tribes. The death blow comes in 1240. Chronicles contradict each other on the exact date, but towards the end of the year, the Mongols reach Kiev. They are led by Batu Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan, and have been pushing into Eastern Europe via the Caucasus. Batu reportedly declares, I will tie Kiev to the tail of my horse. And he is a man of his word. After a bitter siege, the Mongols breach the city's walls and brutal fighting commences in the streets. Mongols raise nearly the entire city and slaughter its inhabitants. It is the end of the Kievan Rus and of the greatness of Kiev. It will be another 200 years before it is prosperous enough to be granted self-government by its latest ruler, the Grand Duke of Lithuania. Okay, so after that legendary battle for Kiev, Let's fast forward several hundred years to the 20th century and the Russian Revolutionary Period. What happened in those centuries? Well, a lot, obviously. Kiev, and in fact all of Ukraine, is fought over between Lithuanians, Poles, Cossacks, and Russians. At the moment, we're working on an episode on the development of Ukrainian national identity. So wait around for that if you want to learn a little more about the context of such conflicts. Anyhow, the amount of times the city changes hands during the Russian Revolutionary Period is dizzying. The February Revolution of 1917 overthrew the Tsarist system throughout Russia and put in its place the provisional government. On top of the socioeconomic questions that race through the former Russian Empire, national ones are also reignited in provinces like Ukraine. The Central Rada is established in Kiev to coordinate the the hopeful national revolution, and quickly becomes the, the dominant movement among ethnic Ukrainians from all ideological persuasions. The Russian provisional government actually agrees to recognize Ukrainian autonomy and allow the Rada to administer the Ukrainian provinces. But the glory days do not last for long. Like everywhere else affected by the revolution, competing political groups fight for power. The Bolsheviks come to power in Russia after the October Revolution, and this is where things start to get messy. In November, the Central Rada and the Bolsheviks switch between fighting together for Kiev or against each other. The conflict becomes official when the Central Rada proclaims the Ukrainian National Republic on November 20th, 1917, and the Bolsheviks flee to Kharkov. In December, the Bolsheviks sign an armistice with the Central Powers not wanting to fight the Tsar's war, and in the new year, they negotiate treaty terms. But they're also invading Ukraine. As they close in on Kiev, Bolshevik sympathizers inside the city stage a revolt. It fails, but it eases the Bolshevik advance, and they eventually occupy the capital on February 9th, immediately beginning a reign of terror. But Bolshevik Kiev only lasts a few weeks because German high command forces Soviet Russia to surrender nearly all of Ukraine to Germany and Austria-Hungary and the humiliating Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. The Rada also signs its own treaty with the Central Powers, 
So when their forces march into Kiev, the Ukrainian nationalists re-enter with them. And this, this pretty much sets the pattern for the next few years. Kiev goes through coups, more Bolshevik occupations, and a Polish occupation before eventually once again coming under permanent Bolshevik control. Its population and its buildings are decimated, and it will be neglected by Soviet authorities as they make Kharkov the capital of Soviet Ukraine. Now, let me turn to Kiev in World War II. One of the many reasons why Putin's invasion of Ukraine has hit all of us at Time Goes pretty hard is that we're seeing the same battle sites of that war being fought for all over again. Now, I've already covered the 1941 battle for Kiev on our World War II series, but I will summarize it again here. The Axis powers invade the Soviet Union on June 22nd and quickly push deep into Ukraine. By late August, Kiev is under serious threat with Heinz Guderian's panzers driving down from the north and Ewald von Kleist's driving from the southeast, it looks like an unprecedented number of Soviet troops will be encircled. The Soviets take massive casualties trying and failing to stop this. Requests from Soviet commanders to Stavka for permission to withdraw to at least, at least more defensible positions are rejected on September 7th, 10th, and 11th. Joseph Stalin then orders that no one should abandon Kiev or blow up bridges without Stavka permission. For good measure, he also sacks the commander of the defense of Ukraine, Semyon Budioni, and replaces him with Semyon Timoshenko. Timoshenko assures Stavka he can hold Kiev, but Mikhail Kirponos and his entire southwestern front are already nearly entirely surrounded. There is still an escape route to the east, but Stalin doesn't allow it. As towns on the road to Kiev fall, Red Army Chief of Staff Boris Shaposhnikov gets the word that disaster is soon at hand. Shaposhnikov passes this on to Stalin, who responds, Major General Tupikov has submitted a panicky report to the General Staff. On the contrary, the situation requires the maintenance of extreme coolness and steadfastness on the part of all commanders at all levels. It is necessary to take all measures to hold occupied positions and especially to hold on to the flanks. You must compel Kuznetsov and Potapov to cease their withdrawal. You must instill the entire front with the necessity to fight on stubbornly. It is necessary to fulfill the orders given to you by Stalin on September 11th. On the 16th, Guderian and Kleist link up, trapping 600,000 Soviet soldiers. On the 17th, Kerponos finally gets permission to try to break out to the east, which is good because he started doing it already. On September 19th, Kiev falls to the Germans. Some forces do manage to break out of the Axis cauldron, but not that many. Kerponos and his staff find themselves trapped by a panzer division and make a last stand. He and many others die, and the rest are taken prisoner. It is a colossal disaster. Around 700,000 men are either killed, wounded, taken prisoner, or are just missing. That's four Soviet armies. The doors to the Donbass region and the southern road to Moscow are wide open. That was the first battle of Kiev in World War II. There was actually little fighting in the city itself, but it still suffered a great amount of damage when the Soviets mined its public buildings, industrial sites, cathedrals, and bridges. Kiev is then subject to a brutal occupation. They systematically murder all Jews. They arrest and murder anyone suspected of being close to the Communist Party. The Nazi master plan for Ukraine is to turn it into a vast agricultural resource well. To encourage this, they largely halt childhood education, restrict food supply, and generally let the city fall into further ruin. But spoiler, Kiev will be liberated in late 1943. The battle for the city will be part of a much wider Soviet operation to recover the eastern bank of the Dnieper from the Axis forces. Like the 1941 battle, the decisive action will come in the surrounding area and not the city itself. There will be some fighting in the suburbs, but when Soviet armor rolls into the city center on November 6, they will do so unopposed. Fighting to secure it will continue for days, but November 6 is the symbolic date for the liberation of Kiev, partly because it's the day before the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. I will not give any more detail on this now, 
because we have not gotten there on our World War II series yet. But I will talk about one important aspect. The loyalty of Ukrainians is a complicated and controversial issue in the history of World War II. Having spent decades at the receiving end of Stalinist tyranny, some Ukrainian towns and villages welcomed German troops. Well, they welcomed all the Axis troops as liberators in 1941. Ukrainian soldiers likely were more willing to surrender than Russian ones, and a few went a step further and enlisted into Axis ranks. Ukrainian nationalists also committed or were accessory to some of the most brutal atrocities of the Holocaust, the Lviv pogroms being some of the most infamous. But pro-Nazi feeling and ideology was always a minority among the Ukrainian people, especially after the occupying Germans quickly proved themselves to be anything but liberators. As was the case across Europe, most Ukrainian civilians just did what they could to survive the war. And when it comes to military service, the numbers speak for themselves. By 1944, around a million former Soviet citizens will be fighting for Germany, and 220,000 of them will be Ukrainian. But that is nowhere near the 4.5 million Ukrainians fighting in the Red Army. So Ukrainians will make up the majority of Kiev's liberating force in 1943. The liberating formation will be the first Ukrainian front. Now this name actually refers to the geographic jurisdiction of the formation and not its national makeup, but Ukrainians do still form the majority of its ranks. The Red Army, will have a policy of recruiting from local populations both in advance and as they liberate new areas. Time and time again, the population of Kiev has risen up to defend their city. For the most part, their response has been one of patriotic duty. When they fought for independence, it was for the new Ukrainian state. When the Axis invaded, it was for the Ukrainian SSR and the Soviet Union. In 2022, it is for the nation of Ukraine as it is being invaded, once again by a murderous tyrant. One can only hope that one day the Kievans find peace and are allowed to continue to forge their own destiny and concentrate their patriotism on building a city for future and security, stability, and freedom. Into context is actually an idea Spartacus and I had and began working with back in 2014, but we were never able to continue until now because it never really had the immediacy it currently does. If you would like to see more of this and more Time Ghost history in general, then join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com because that is what makes all of this possible. See you next time.